That demo too, that's what really got me into sabotage. That got my foot in the door when we heard that John was taking a, a break. Hey, Zach, how's it going? Good. Great to see you. I, you. You can hear me though, right? Am I on everything I'm supposed to be on? Yes. Yep. Sounds perfect. It's just audio anyways, so okay, no need for video. Audio? Okay, gotcha. We can get right into it. Sorry, that's my fault on the delay. Good to see you and I hope you're doing good out there in Windsor. Yeah, same. Last we spoke, I think you're in Michigan now? Well, I was. I was there for three years, and I but I moved back to South Carolina, my uh, my original, uh, you know, my indigenous state. Oh, okay. Oh, right on. Where were you again in Michigan? It was near Jackson, wasn't uh, it? Brooklyn. Brooklyn, southern Michigan, about an hour from uh, the Ohio border. Okay. It, Brooklyn, isn't that the Michigan International Speedway? That is correct. Okay. That's why I've heard of it. We okay. live in the same town. I believe the county line runs in between them. So if you go to the racetrack, it's Lenawee County. And then I lived in Jackson County. Oh, okay. But it's the same town. It's kind of funny because Lenawee or whatever has got the, the border. But uh, I'm basically, oh, maybe three minutes from the track. And we went to all the races there. Every one of them that they had, they they cut it down. It used to have two races in NASCAR per year. Now they only have one. Oh, that's a bummer. I went yeah, to... It is a bummer. I want to say five years ago, maybe, uh, Skid Row played. It was an interesting crowd because it's not who you'd normally go to see that kind of show, but it was fun nonetheless. Right. The, the little, the stage outside that they did the entertainment area uh, out by, at the track. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a little um, sort of grassy patch. In the yes. Back. Yep. And you know what? I was there, but I think I was out of town. I was living there then. And I don't know what, why we didn't get out to see Skid but I've saw several shows out there. I saw Lover Boy. Oh, there you go. And and I saw Thirty Eight Special. But I don't know why we didn't see the new incarnation. I call it new incarnation. It's got the same singer um, for Thirty Eight. I mean, for um, Skid Row that they have now. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, ZP from Dragon Force before. That's yeah. what I saw. I've, I've seen him with Eric yeah. though. He is unbelievable. Yeah, that's right. Uh, really great. And I think that that's why they're doing so well. And you know. Uh, Hats off to Dave the Snake Sabo for uh, for getting it together. Yeah. I mean, ZP was great. Like, I had no problems with him, but ZP was sort of filling in, and it's like, okay, Eric's the guy. Like, they, it's the new Sebastian. Yes, I agree. So, yeah, amazing. I, I love that. It's funny. Dave, Snake there, is involved in management for other bands and all kinds yeah, of stuff. I think he does Down, if I'm not mistaken. Phil Anselmo's yes. band. He works for um who's the manager for KISS? Is it still Doc McGee? I know yes. he was. Yeah, he worked he's a day-to-day guy for Doc McGee. Oh, that's hilarious. So in, in addition to Moonlighting and Skid Row, he also does day-to-day with Doc. That's hilarious. Yes, he worked for Doc McGee's manager. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the day-to-day guy for like uh even Caleb Johnson, who sings for TSO. Okay, yep. Yeah, Dave's his uh, day-to-day manager. That's so funny. Wow. Because he's managed by Dr. McGee. Isn't that funny? What a small world, eh? That's so funny. It is small. <laughs> I could fill you in on many nooks and crannies, but I know I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be getting off track. But anyway, all right, I'll let you get to your pertinent oh, questions. Oh, good. Um, well, if it, well, we'll jump around to a couple bands really quick then. But um, you know, the first thing I'm aware of you doing is Wicked Witch. And I love that hmm. you know that old demo, right, from 9091, whenever that was. Oh, thank you. Tell me how that band started and doing that uh, demo and those songs. I'd love to learn more about that band. Well, it goes back, okay, I was doing, I graduated college. And instead of going into the my chosen field, which is supposed to be uh, psychology and going ahead and getting a master's, I said, wait a minute, I'm not done with music. And I didn't major in music because I'd done so much since I was nine. And I was like, I'm going to get bored. And then they're going to try to make me a band director somewhere. But I didn't go into the music major, but I went into the, I got a bachelor of science in psychology. But so I go straight there and I go, I'm going to Hollywood. And you're like, what? <laughs> so I go out there to Los Angeles and go to the first year that they ever had the Vocal Institute of Technology, VIT school, which is connected to GIT, which is a little trade school for musicians out there. I've been there. I, I didn't I didn't take courses there, but I've been just like on a tour or whatever. Really? Uh, really yes. Nice so it's big now. Uh, I was at the first year and it was only a six month course. So I was like, that fits me because I've been singing. I'm just trying to make the jump from behind the drum kit because drums is my first instrument. So I had to make the the jump. Uh, so that would be a quick, uh, nice cap training course for me. And it worked great. It was really good. And I got through it and, you know, it seemingly worked because of my career trajectory. But 
So when I'm there, I with uh, I meet a guy named Matt Leff. Unfortunately, Matt passed away a few years ago from brain cancer, but he's the one who started Wicked Witch. Oh, he, he was the so, guitar player for the band, right? Yes, yeah. the guitarist. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, on guitar is the one you hear. Um, he auditioned for Dio back then, but he got second to Rowan Robinson uh, for Lock Up the Wolves. Oh, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah. So then he goes, well, I didn't get that. I was close, but I don't I, it was, I don't know what exactly it was. You know, they're going to get all many, many people get a lot more people don't get stuff than get stuff. And you never even know what the nitpicky things were. But he sure what ripped as far as I was concerned. So I was like, yeah, he goes, let's write some songs. So we wrote with a bass player that we met there. We met, we wrote that song, Fly Away. Okay, yep. And then that was the first one. And we recorded a demo at the MIT studio uh, at, at the school, you know, Musicians Institute. So he goes, well, hey, let's go back where I live in Boston. There's plenty of places to play. We can play in Rhode Island, Boston, uh, in Massachusetts, as well as uh, New Hampshire for the most part. And there's like 80 clubs because it was still hopping back then at the end of the 80s. So I was like, okay. So we went there and we went and had a couple of lineup things here or there and, you know, maybe a six month period of just trying to get the right lineup. And then here comes Jeff Plate, the drummer who I brought into Sabotage later, right? And he's the drummer for TSO, the East Band. Yeah. So basically he's our drummer that we settled on. Then we recorded the demo that you're talking about. That's got Jeff, me and Matt and Matt. Yeah, and that was like Soul to Fire and Breakdown and all those tunes, eh? Yes, and we did that with the guy who mixed Extreme Records, um, mixed records for Extreme. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, who has now popped back on the scene recently, right? They just put a new record out. Yeah, I'm, try- I'm trying to think of what the guy's name is. He, he did the first Extreme oh, record. Bob, uh, Rob, Bob. Something. Yeah, yeah, I, I know oh, exactly. Gosh. I mean, I, I got to look up the name. <laughs> Yeah, we yeah we, I'd have to look. I'm so I'm so sorry. We're talking. Ugh, we're going back a little bit, tr- testing my memory now. But um, <laughs> so that's how that whole thing got started. That demo too. That's what really got me into sabotage. To tell you the truth, that got my foot in the door when we heard that John was taking a, a break, and uh, that was around '91. So that demo is very interesting that you brought that up. It served several huge purposes. That it is, unbeknownst to those who didn't know about the little demo, as we will call it, the little demo that could. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I Um, downloaded that forever ago off the internet, and I didn't put two and two together at the time that you were the singer. I was just like, wow, it's a great singer. It's a great demo and listened to it for years. And then it wasn't until I think you did Machines of Grace that I was like, wait, why do I know this soul to fire? Wait, wait a second. That's Wicked Witch. And then I start to put the pieces together. I'm like, that was Zach Stevens singing on that, you know? Yeah. The name had to change because somebody had already gotten that name since we had disbanded and we got a cease and desist letter. So it it became, you know, Machines of Grace is the old Wicked Witch. And that's the same lineup, you know, basically besides a bass player change, I think. But um, so now Machines of Grace is the better demo. (laughs) (laughs) But no, that was well done. And uh, gosh, we even used our old sound man that used to mix us live. He he had gone on and done all kind of good stuff in the industry and was mixing and mixed that album, Machines of Grace. So a lot of the the old family they still stuck in there. Oh, that's great! Yeah, it's the the re-recorded versions are fantastic too. Thank you. It, it certainly sounded a little bit more you know modern with getting it on a new you know getting it on a modern desk, um, you know mixing console and everything. But um, yeah. Kind of though that goes about as far back as you can go. Great question. So jumping ahead a few years, I'd like to we'll get to the new album in just a sec. But I've got to ask you about this one. So one of my favorite sabotage albums is the live in Japan. Mm. Uh, what can you tell me about doing that album, that live to you know all of that sort of thing, that era of the band? That is the when I think the first time that we saw Jeff Plate performing live. I can say that much. Because he did some of the stuff on Handful of Rain, but Wackles was still around during the recording of Handful of Rain. You know what I'm saying? So I would say yeah. that marks the first time that you see Jeff doing a great job. That was recorded over like three or four shows that we did in Japan in 94, the first time that Sabotage had ever gone over there. That was awesome. 
It's my only time I've ever been to Japan. I have not gone back. We have not gone back since then. That's crazy. You'd think, I mean, does does TSO have a big audience in Japan? No, I would say no. We've never even uh, even attempted it. Wow. It's tough because like TSO works great in America, but even if you take it to Europe, they all grow up with classical music over there. So it's not a big deal. And it just doesn't really ring the same. It, it would be, take a lot of work and a lot of money and a lot of years to even work it to a workable, um, I'd say a workable extent in Europe even. So TSO is really a USA born and bred workable thing that really works here and, and would take millions and millions of bukus of dollars to make work anywhere else. I would think too, because um, Christmas would be totally different too. You know, Europe, yes. it's, it's still a holiday, but it's not like it is in North America. That's right. So it's treated much differently. It has many days depending on, you know, the different little various ways of celebrating it. And so, yeah, it's completely different. So that's, you know, but that's all right. It, it's enough that for us to handle just to be able to play, the, <laughs> just to be able to do in the U.S. Canada, it works great. Where you're at, oh, my God, you know, like we should go there more often. I think the last time we were there was 2019. I don't, you know, I get it that the pandemic put us behind a little bit in regards to getting to Canada. But but I would imagine we might see it coming up uh, in the oh, coming I'm sure. year. As of last year, I mean, everything's basically open. Everything's and back open. To normal. It's, it's, it's just like the States. I, I go to Michigan all the time, and I'm like, eh, it's, it's the same as on. It's the you, same. You guys were way ahead because you guys got the vaccine first. But other than that, it's, it's pretty much back it's, to normal it, now. That's right. So I would imagine we're going to be seeing Canada again, which is great. I love going up there and playing. I wish I could have played Canada with all my bands, with every one of them, to tell you the truth a bit regrettable on that because I just think Canada is a great place for rock and roll. It's well supported and gosh, I wish I could have done a lot more work, but Hey, who knows what's in the future? You know, it may happen, but being, let me see what exactly where I was there. <laughs> well, so live in Japan, well, live in Japan, live in Japan. So that was cool. We took all, we, we did a mobile recording truck and just tried to get all the basic tracks down to everything. Then we got and cleaned it all up back home it was pretty easy. I mean, you know, it was kind of like maybe making a Kiss live album or whatever. You go get a mobile recording truck, you you get as much as you can, and then you clean up any uh, blatant clunks uh, or, or, you know, blatant little, you know, things here or there that work live but might not necessarily work, you know, when you're strict audio tape. Yeah. Yeah, it was pr uh, really pretty painless. I mean, taking songs from a lot of different albums and a handful of Rain being the latest album that you know right before that was done it was fantastic i mean i i really you know and even the japanese scene for heavy metal and for american metal bands has changed so drastically it's you have to really have an in over there at all times and you know it's almost like you have to have one of those little robots off of the mandalorian that can be programmed to go <laughs> and fly over there and then give you back information about when you would if you would ever really have a chance to find a niche over there that scene changes so fast, and I think that's one of the reasons we couldn't really find a, an affordable option, you know, to go back and try it again. But who knows? I would have to figure out what's going on. Maybe I have to read, read Burn Magazine 83 times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, their popular metal magazine over there with two N's, by the way, Burn and two R's, right? Yeah. You, you need to, uh, I forget who I was talking to, but I was talking to a musician recently who, like, their biggest audience is Japan. Oh, yeah. And they said the one thing is you, you need a constant stream of stuff always coming out, singles and whatever. And, you know, they like to always sort of have something in the pipeline for the band. Wow. That's tough to keep up with, isn't it? To have a constant stream of stuff like singles. Sing so, in other words, you release your stuff. If you want to appeal to Japan, you release it by single, 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 single. Yeah. Oh, yeah. album. But you've already heard all the singles, but here's the package album. And after that, a special dance by Zach Stevens. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. No. That's great. That sounds hard to keep up with, my friend. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, that's a lot, a lot of work. <laughs> um, so we're quickly running out of time. So I want to get to the new Archon Angel album, too, that's coming out in mid-April. Now, how did the band originally come together? Was that Serafino coming to you saying, we want to put something together? Or how, how did the band form? Yeah, he got uh, Aldo Lonobile, uh, the producer and the guitarist who had bands like Secret Sphere and stuff like that uh, back in the past. That's how I knew about him. Prog metal stuff coming out of Italy. And he told Aldo, get in touch with me 
Aldo really loves sabotage. Like he's in his mid thirties, I think, or, you know, somewhere he's a lot younger, but like he really loves the band. So he's like, Hey, you're a big influence and everything. We could probably do some pretty decent music together. And frontiers would like me to produce records with you saying, let's come up with a band name featuring and whatever featuring Zach Stevens. And I went, Oh, that's pretty cool. So it sounded neat. So that's how it all got started. They just said, Hey, work with Aldo. He'll produce your records and do it that way and do ever how many we want. We'll go play when we can. We, you know, but we're going to put out this music. So that was how it basically how it came together. So my wife who writes all the lyrics and stuff, she came up with Ark and Angel. I think that's a killer name. And she provides all the lyrics and all the storyboard and all of the concept for the record. And that's cool because we, you know, work well together. Obviously there's a yeah. chemistry there. <laughs> so I really get a lot of inspiration from her lyrics and stuff and her stories that she gives to the Archon, who is like the main character. You know, these are stories in the life of an Archon who basically it's kind of complicated with Gnosticism and everything, which is like a second century religion. Yeah. But the only way for the humans to speak to the gods that, that run everything, uh, the Demiurge, who would be the main boss who created the earth. And then the Christian part of it is that Christ's role, main role is just to be the redeemer of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a complicated religious thing, but in that whole thing, the archon is the only way that the people of earth can speak to the gods. Okay. Yeah. So he's very important. He's the mediator uh, and like a, a, an emissary would probably be a better word Yeah. to get that word Hey, the people of Earth need this. So now we take that whole thing and put it in modern day. And so it's fictitious as far as I know. I've never walked out going to Starbucks and saw an Archon flying around with his giant wings. But we're saying that he is coming to the modern day world to help us out with the the Earth, you know, the world's problems now. With everything being so crazy. Yeah. You know, the post-pandemic thing, the whole pandemic thing, the Cold Wars that are starting up again, unfortunately. You know, we could use some help. So it's kind of like that. And then we we take every song being a story in his life. Okay. Yeah. And that's kind of where the whole thing is. That's where the whole concept lies. So I'll say, like, for this new record, you guys really heavied it up. Like, the first record felt like you were definitely going for more of a Edge of Thorns kind of thing. Mm-hmm. This one, I think, really found its own footing. I mean, there's still nods to Sabotage, but it's, I don't want to say more modern, but definitely you know, a pedal to the metal when it comes to heaviness and whatnot. Yes, I agree. I think it got a little bit more, you know, on the aggressive, you know, side, maybe a little heavier. You know, we had a process that we kind of had to get started on the first album. And now everybody's really familiar with the process and the roles are known. And I think everybody got a little more comfortable. And so we said, hey, let's crank it up a gear or two and see what happens. There's still some, I think, yeah, you were reminding me, that the first album seemed a, lot, a little bit more prog to me, like progressive. Yeah, This one seems a little more heavy, but has some prog elements. But yeah, I, I totally agree. We, we still have stuff that might be a little bit more on the epic side, more prog. But the thing is, yeah, I think it went in a logical fashion. You know, you got maybe a song like Lake of Fire or something might be the most progressive song on this album, whereas we might have had two or three on the last one. Yeah, and then, I mean, now Quicksand is a pretty good indication of where the record's at. Yes, and what's interesting there is Chris o- uh, Chris Caffrey has contributed writing, and he contributed that one on Quicksand, by the way. Oh, that's funny, because I interviewed him for uh, his, uh, what's his band, uh, Spirits of Fire. Yes. And it's funny, because it's definitely in that heavy vein, too, so that that totally makes sense that he was involved with that. And, um... Aldo, you know, our producer and guitarist in Archangel, he produced the last Spirits of Fire album as well. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> so the family, you can see now the the close inner circle here that's working. Yeah, Chris contributed Quicksand, and so it's really cool. And it was great to do that again because, gosh, I don't think it's been since Circle to Circle that, that me and Chris have written stuff together, or he joined the writing group, you know what I mean? So that's cool. And uh, Aldo, you know, he did Jeff Tate's solo record, too, he produced. Yeah, the um, Sweet Oblivion. Yeah, Sweet yeah. Oblivion, oh. yes. And so now that's three that I know of. That's Jeff's, mine, and Chris's. So, yeah, it's kind of a tight, you know, smaller inner working uh, family of stuff going on here, at least 
producer wise without it, but it's cool. You know, we're getting, you know, stuff out there and I, you know, that's what it's all about. Just keep getting your art out there. For sure. Well, it, it helps too. I mean, he's, he's a hell of a guitar player, songwriter, producer, mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, I I think it was with Chris or whoever I interviewed that he worked with recently. I said, I think this guy's becoming my new favorite guitar player. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's amazing. All, all those just great. Like he, he has serious guitar chops too. Like what a great guitar player. Yeah, I agree. Um, and he keeps getting better. You know, that's the reason we're doing these projects is just to keep everybody sharp. I do it to keep learning and keep getting and, you know, try to keep getting better. I mean, I you can rest on all the stuff you've always done, but that's not really forwarding the whole thing. And I get a little scared about getting sedentary. You know what I mean? Because yeah. So this is the kind of stuff like Archangel and, you know, is, is the basis of getting out there, keeping everything sharp, learning. You know what I mean? I'm always learning. I'm learning from my wife. I'm learning theory. I'm learning from Aldo. Uh, you know, I try to learn something in every, out. you know, guest appearance that I do. Uh, so it's working. And as long as that's happening, I feel a little bit better. We got two videos out there to check out from this record. It's a uh, fortress, the first single, and then the afterburn. So I don't know if you caught those two fortress and afterburn. I haven't seen the, I'll have to go check out the video, but I've, I've heard the whole record several times uh, from the promo and I'm absolutely loving it. It's uh, I, I don't want to say better than the first one, but it's as good. <laughs> You know, oh it's, wow, yeah, it's. I, I mean, I, I loved that first record too. I mean, it's funny because it came out at the start of COVID, yeah, and I listened to it for like the first three months of COVID nonstop. So, yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was interesting the timing of that first record. What you know, we came out and we played two shows on 70,000 tons of metal, and it was virtually one week later the world is shut down, and now the music business has to reconfigure everything they ever knew. It's unbelievable. The whole the whole world, the last <laughs> five years, you just go, I can't believe we just lived through that. I know how, how did the music business even you know it came out more you know i can say one thing it seems like the music business came out with a lot higher ticket prices oh my god yes <laughs> i used to go see a lot more concerts and now i have to be more selective because there's so you know, many I used concerts. To see two for the price of one yes now we have an abundance of concerts at a premium price <laughs> Thank you so much, Pandemic. Yeah, means every, everybody's got to be amazing. that much better, right? <laughs> yeah, you got to be. Uh, hey, the pressure on all the artists, right? Your, your show must be four times better because your ticket price is four times more. <laughs> well, Zach, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to do this. Love hearing the old stories and, um, you know, especially the Wicked Witch. That's always wanted to know more about that band and how that got started. Yeah, thank you so, so uh, much. I appreciate you having me, Brandon. Oh, for sure. Yeah, best of luck with the new record. It's fantastic. So... Hoping you guys can do a third, because um, I'm loving what I'm hearing so far with Archon Angel. Yeah, the plan is to do uh, several more, at least one more, you know, if not more. That, that's what oh, the deal was. Yeah, fantastic. Four oh, at least great. is what we're in for. So thank you so much. I'm so glad you like it, man. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. All right, I'll let you get to it. Hey, you too, man. Great talking to you. Talk to you soon. Right. Thanks, Bye. Thanks.